Welcome, everybody. This is the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. And every week we bring you the stories of people who are making a difference in the lives of others locally, globally, and digitally. We're part of Rotary International, 1.4 million Rotarians and Rotaractors and over 36,000 clubs working to, to live out what we call service above self, that, that desire to, uh, to find ways to make a difference in the lives of others. And we see part of our role in that, in that endeavor as telling the stories of people who are doing wonderfully cool things that you might not have heard about. And so to that end, today we have with us Camilla Johns of the United Kingdom's Antarctic Heritage Trust. And she's going to tell us about the work that they are doing in Antarctica. And I think we should all be prepared for some pretty amazing pictures. Camilla, welcome to the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. And thank you for taking your time to tell us the stories of the work you are doing. Thank you very much, Rushton. Well, I'm really, really pleased to be here, everybody. Um, hello from the UK. Um, and I'm going to share my screen now and some slides to tell you a little bit more about Antarctica. So oh, here we go. So um, my name is Camilla Johns. I'm from the UK Antarctic Heritage Trust, and we are a charity um, that works to help future um, and current generations better understand um, and discover Antarctica and its past as well as its future. Um, and we do this by caring for six historic buildings um, which are protected internationally um, and they are dotted along the Antarctic Peninsula uh, 10,000 miles away from here um, in the UK. And these special buildings represent uh, the birthplace of climate science uh, specifically British climate science on the Antarctic continent. So they are completely unique in the world. Um, they are modest wooden huts uh, with amazing stories um, of survival, courage and discovery. Um, and we protect them every year and we share their stories with schools and communities and people around the world um, because they are so uh, unique and amazing and inspiring. So Antarctica, where are we talking about um, this amazing continent, the seventh continent, uh, huge 5.5 million square miles in size, um, larger than the whole of the US and Mexico put together, um, formed 34 million years ago um, and uh, an environmentally very important place uh, containing 90% of the Earth's ice and 70% of the fresh water. Um, it is also uh, the coldest place on Earth and the windiest place on Earth, uh, which is why we like to send uh, a team there every year to deliver conservation work. Um, it is also an amazingly special place for wildlife. Uh, it contains uh, amazingly 9,000 different species, um, but most famously uh, the penguin, uh, not the polar bear, um, and uh, many different species of bird life um, and seals and whales, um, which are unique to Antarctica. But what's really amazing about Antarctica, uh, beyond all the things we know, is its human history. Um, and here is an amazing map from the 1700s um, where the Antarctic continent simply doesn't exist. Um, so Antarctica was only discovered by humans in 1821, so just 200 years ago. Um, and that really kind of marked the start of uh, human history in Antarctica as we know it. Um, so really amazing. It's a very, very recent uh, history um, for such a huge, huge place. This is the most famous part of Antarctica's history. This is the heroic era and some quite familiar faces here, Captain Scott, Sir Ernest Shackleton. Um, and these explorers were starting to kind of con uh, conquer the continent, uh, reach the magnetic and geographic poles, um, climb mountains and do amazing things. Um, and they create the really famous stories that inspire people today about Antarctic history and human uh, courage and exploration. Um, but what's also notable about this time was the amount of scientific uh, data and information that people were starting to collect um, on the continent. And um, knowledge was starting to grow about the science and the relevance of this amazing place. 
and then move forward to the era that I'm talking about today, which is uh, the 1940s onwards. Um, and during the Second World War, uh, the British government launched a top secret expedition down to Antarctica called Operation Tabarin, uh, which is named after a nightclub in Paris. Um, and this marked the start of uh, permanent uh, scientific bases built in Antarctica, which include meteorology, uh, glaciology, uh, geographical surveying. Um, and these very brave men went down there for two years at a time, completely cut off from the outside world and started collecting amazing stories um, and amazing uh, information about our planet, um, as well as kind of human stories of uh, what it's like to be stuck on a base uh, in the Antarctic for years at a time away from your family. Um, this really started the start of um, scientific programmes in Antarctica, particularly for the UK. Um, and some of this information we still draw on today to understand how our climate has changed over the last 80 years. Um, this programme of Antarctic science um, grew quickly. Um, and spread around the continent. And now there are around 30 countries um, operating around 80 Antarctic research stations um, across the continent. So it's a very active area, um, but it's also protected and all of these countries work together um, and in harmony for the purpose of peace and science. And that leads me on to the bases that we look after as a charity not-for-profit. Um, we look after six historic sites in Antarctica, um, and you can see them um, all here. Um, they are all protected under international law for their significance. Um, they're all designated historic sites and monuments, um, and they all represent major achievements in exploration, operations, um, and climate science. Um, and they all have their own personality. They all look a bit different, um, but they all have different stories of discovery, survival, falling down icy crevasses, uh, dog sledding, um, and even flying small airplanes um, into these bases. Um, they're very, very unique, um, and some are relatively easy to get to. So Port Lockroy top left, I'll talk a bit more about in a sec, um, but some are very, very difficult to get to um, and are often uh, cut off by sea ice. So on the right hand side, you can see the Antarctic Peninsula, which is the stretch of land which goes up to South America um, and the distance across this map is thousands and thousands of miles. So a lot of these sites are quite difficult to get to and look after. And this is our flagship site that we care for, Port Lockroy. Um, it is the world's most southerly public post office. Um, it's been a post office since the 1940s. Um, and it is also surrounded by a thousand gentoo penguins. Um, and each year we not only look after it and conserve it, but we send a team of uh, four to five people to man the base um, and to learn about its history. It's a living museum inside and people can also send a postcard home. Um, it's quite often featured in the press. I think we were in the New York Times last year, um, and we also uh, have sometimes up to 4,000 applicants for just four jobs, as you can imagine. But it's a very, very special site um, in a very unique place. This is what it looks like inside. It's, as I said, a living museum. Um, it has lots of original artifacts, the men's workshop, the kitchen, some of the old um, chains before the base was built was um, used for whaling. Um, so we keep it as a kind of living museum that you can experience and imagine what life was like on base in the 1940s and 50s um, when you were working, uh, delivering science away from your family. Um, so it's an amazing place, smells of penguin and oil and um, kind of varnish and all these amazing smells um, but it really is kind of restored to be what it was like um, in in those days 
Um, as I mentioned, it's also a post office. Um, it's one of the most quirky aspects of Antarctic science bases, um, particularly for Britain, is that um, post offices popped up with these science bases um, and mail was sent back um, around the world. Um, and as you can see from this picture, some of the bases even had pets company. Um, sadly, that didn't always end so well, uh, especially for this pig, but um, they did have um, some, some kind of animals on base to keep them entertained. And these are some of the postcards we send back. They are all stamped by hand. Um, we send about 80,000 postcards every single year um, all around the world. And another part of the work we do is caring for um, the kind of Gentoo penguin colony. So every year um, for the last 25 years, apart from the pandemic, we've been collecting data on the breeding success of penguins in relation to um, kind of different factors like tourism and climate. Um, and we share our home with them. So we often are doing our work, looking at baby Gentoo penguins and making sure that we're counting their nests uh, every day when we've got a team down there. Um, the biggest remit we have is conservation. Um, as Rushton mentioned um, earlier, we do some really challenging conservation work, um, which involves sending a specialist team down to Antarctica um, and delivering specialist carpentry, conservation, um, and it's, it's very, very time consuming, very specialist, um, requires long planning cycles and um, kind of timbers which are sensitive to heritage. Um, and it's also uh, lots of health and safety that goes into doing conservation at the end of the earth. Um, we're always a thousand miles from the nearest hospital. So we take that very, uh, very seriously. And this is just one of the um, buildings that we restored last year. We turned it from its blue to its original orange colour. Um, and it's a really important site um, that was used uh, as a as an airport. Amazingly, it's the only protected historic airport in Antarctica, and we conserved it back to its former glory. This year, we are focusing on this site, which is Detai. It's uh, pretty much the last site that we need to conserve. Um, it needs lots of work doing to it. So we'll be sending a team for the next two years to scan it, do its first ever artifact survey um, and do some pretty significant repairs. So that's our focus for the next two years, um, along with writing the conservation management plan for the wreck of Shackleton's Endurance, which was discovered uh, just last year, 3000 metres under the Weddell Sea. So we will be um, making sure that that wreck is protected um, and the artefacts uh, aren't removed from that. And then finally, just delivering our conservation work and stories back home around the world. Um, half of what we do is conservation and half of what we do is storytelling and making sure that the next generation get to discover and learn about Antarctica. Um, it's a hugely important part of what we do because we know that most people will never get to visit Antarctica. So um, these stories are relevant to us all um, and our behaviours at home affect the continent. So that is what we do the rest of the year. Thank you very much. All right, Camilla, there, there are so many cool topics that you bring up as a part of, of the presentation and we are excited to get to them. I'll start actually by just introducing the group that we have. So. From our club, we, in addition to me, Rushton, hello, uh, the program chair here in uh, San, San Jose, California. Uh, we also have in the Bay Area, uh, Sandy Stabile, Sandy, and Phil Dean. Phil, good to see you, sir. And our treasurer joining us from Italy is Cecilia Babbert. All right. So, Camilla, I'll start by combining a couple of questions uh, that, uh, that have come in. And they have to do with the buildings, the buildings themselves. They're made of wood. Um, the elements are intense. How how is it that that you choose particular kinds of materials, and has that changed over time? And and is there a tension there between uh, preserving historical buildings and using uh, materials that might actually be better suited to uh, keeping people alive in that environment? Yeah, 
and pigs? Great question, Rushton. Um, it's at the heart of what we do is is heritage, and the conservation work that we deliver on these sites um, aims to be as authentic as possible. So the decisions that we make about the work that happens there are made in consultation with heritage experts, which actually come from all around the world. Um, you know, we have uh, partners in New Zealand, um, across the UK, um, people that feed into making the right conservation decisions for these buildings because they are so unique. So that includes using appropriate materials. Um, that said, if something is structurally unsafe or uh, it needs to be thought about outside the box, then we take that to the committee and our heritage experts, and we might use, for example, a different material to make sure that that, that building is structurally safe. So it's a mixture of both, but as much as possible, we do it within kind of international heritage guidelines for conservation. That, that touches on a theme that you brought up in the presentation and that uh, Phil asks about, which which has to do with the the collaboration among the 30 countries operating these 80 facilities, right? Um, is there an overall management system or do they all operate independently? A mixture of both, really. So that what I what I didn't talk about was the Antarctic Treaty, which is this amazing international agreement um, signed by um, over 50 countries worldwide, uh, which is to protect Antarctica and to make sure that it's um, kept for peace and science. And within that, there are various international committees um, and, and collaboration. So um, it's a real um, kind of example for the rest of the world about how we can all work together and collaborate. So it's a very collaborative um, kind of piece of work, really. Well, in, in terms of, of getting people to to work together, I, I'm also thinking about the four folks that you've got working there who beat out the other 3,996 applicants for, the, for those positions. And, and I was trying to decide what, what they do other than uh, generate postcards if you're doing 80,000 a year. To, to, can you tell a little bit more about, about how people are uh, are choosing to apply, you know, is it is it a sense of adventure? Is it uh, because they are deeply embedded in the science that that does get, uh, yeah, you know, kind of research there? What what kind of things go into how people become good candidates for this very very different environment? Yeah, and I think um, I think what's unique about it is it's one of the only positions that is literally open to the public um, and I should say generally you need a right to work in the UK to work for us but it you know you can you can apply off the street to do this job um, it's it's not for everybody it's four months um, in the Antarctic without a shower we don't have running water we have very limited internet so it's not for everyone but I would say um, those who do apply come from all walks of life um, all ages, um, all sorts of backgrounds. Um, but, you know, some people are scientists, some people are teachers, some people are students, some people, you know, it's a real, real mixture. Um, and it's quite a long process of us meeting them. We go through various selection processes and then we look at how people, at the end of the day, just get on with each other in a team um, because that's really what it comes down to is, is you as a group and how you how you connect with your kind of fellow um, teammate, I guess. So there are sponge baths, I assume, um, but but also kind of this this uh, this experience of of helping people understand what it means to be there. So so what kind of stories do the people who have lived there tell? Uh, what what are some of the common themes in their stories about their experiences? Because uh, there's obviously their work, and then there's just the 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 personal experience of of being somewhere that is so far removed from from their life experience. Yeah, and it, it is um, life changing for many of the people that go to work as part of the teams. Um, we have a real mixture of people as I've mentioned so those who are based at our Port Lockroy site you know are there for four months 
away from their family you know you, you can't use a phone your normal phone um there's no whatsapp or um you don't have access to your own email or anything and um it's uh pretty refreshing actually in this day and age uh people that go um go down there often actually end up kind of working in antarctic projects in other sectors uh, whether that's on ships or in kind of science um sectors um so there's a lot of story of just human connection you know writing letters in the evening um playing games um all the things that we used to do um and just how Antarctica gives you a completely different perspective on the world um, that we all live in. It's it's like another planet, you know, it's so far away and it's so uh, dominated by wildlife. You know, it's not a place where people uh, really exist. Um, and that's very, very unique. So for everybody that goes down there, it's quite a kind of profound experience normally. All right. So so in in thinking about that, and and what it means to to be in a place like that, um, you know. I wonder about uh, the kinds of things that come up when we think about just living there. So so do do they talk? I mean, I was surprised in the pictures to see people wearing what looked like um, per perfectly strong sweaters, but not coats in some of it. So what 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 is the range of temperatures? What are what are some of the other things that people experience? You know, other other than no email and no shower, uh, you know, what what are some of the other things people experience when they when they live and work there? Sure. So um, it's not actually as cold as uh, we all think. When we think of Antarctica, we think you know there's really you know freezing, freezing temperatures, um, but the Antarctic Peninsula kind of juts out from the continent, and so it tends to be you know around kind of zero minus five. Um, uh, with the caveat that we are only there in the Antarctic summer, um, in the winter it is totally frozen in. Nobody is there. Um, it's not a not a good place to be. It's mostly dark, um, <laughs> um, so it's not a great place to be. But it's actually pretty manageable. But the teams that go down there have full outdoor thermal kit um, and are working all the time. Uh, we obviously welcome visitors to the post office, um, but we're also doing kind of manual work on the museum, cleaning artifacts and things like that. So the team are very, very active. There's not much um, standing around, but no, just life on the island. It's um, it's quite a small island. It's the size of a, a kind of a, a foot, um, football or soccer pitch. It's quite small. Um, they do not have um, much time to kind of do much other than welcome visitors, send postcards, sort out the building, count the penguins. Um, but, you know, a day is getting up early, welcoming people, you know, experiencing the penguins. They're all around you. Um, but also for our other sites, a conservation, um, you know, we have a camp of um, conservation specialists going out this year and they will spend six weeks camping on the ice um, and delivering artifact conservation, um, surveying the building, repairing timber. Um, and that that is that is life on base. You know, they're camping in tents um, for six weeks and delivering active conservation work every single day in these really changeable conditions. Um, you never know what it's going to be like. It could be sunny and beautiful or it could be stormy with, a, you know, 100 kilometer hour winds. So it's very, very variable. So so there's let me pull up several questions together uh, on on that front. If people are visiting, uh, they they then, you know, are are part of some organization that gets them there. Are, are there are there two or three main ones that that would allow people to visit? Uh, it, it, are there regulations related to who can go and why? Can you speak a little to that? Sure. Yes. So there is um, there are various companies and vessels that um, offer trips to Antarctica that can either be. Um, a tourism trip or scientific vessels um, and also um, military vessels as well. Um, but if you are visiting Antarctica as a tourist, you can, there are a, a number of companies who take expedition vessels down to um, a small area of the peninsula. Um, they very rarely visit anywhere else on the continent. It's so vast and so huge and so cold, but there is a part of the peninsula they do visit. Um, 
And so we 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 welcome people who are stopping by, um, but there is a very um, strict protocol around that. Uh, uh, an organisation called IATO, who regulate uh, any kind of activity um, around tourism in Antarctica, uh, and that is all within the Antarctic Treaty guidelines for uh, you know environment and uh, visitor numbers. It's very strictly controlled. All right. As a as a final question before we start winding things down, if someone cannot make it down to Antarctica, uh, I see from your website that there are a variety of things there and that opportunities to uh, to do something related to postcards and 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 all sorts of beautiful pictures. Uh, there's there's a podcast that's mentioned. Uh, there are videos uh, referenced as well. Can you tell a little bit about the the ukaht.org site? Uh, for those who might want to visit this afternoon without getting too far from home? Sure, yes. So if you would like to discover more about Antarctica, find out more about the sites and their histories, um, or even just get tips for um, reading, watching in your own time, uh, you go to our site, www.ukaht.org. Um, and as Rushton said, we have um, a podcast series, uh, which was really well received. You can listen to that. Lots of different interesting tales about architecture and penguins and um, women in Antarctica and all sorts of interesting topics. Um, we have lots of information, webinars, all sorts. Um, and also you can uh, send your very own postcard. If you see this before the 5th of October, we are doing a limited um, offer around the 30th birthday of our charity uh, where you can make a small donation and we will send you a postcard from Antarctica. So if you visit our website, you can do that right now um, or send one to friends and family. Um, and similarly, if you would like to support this work at all or be involved, um, you can make a donation on our website. Um, but we also have a CAF America Friends Fund, um, which you can Google via their site as well. So lots to discover, lots to learn. Um, and do share Antarctica um, with as many people as you can. Wonderful. Well, we'll we'll come back to you for a final word in just a moment. But to wind things down, thank you very much for joining us for this recording. It's our hope that the stories that we share through the Rotary E Club of Silicon Valley are the kinds of stories that get you excited about the good work being done in so many different spheres all over the world. We hope that you will tell others about it, that you might also take a look at our podcast series. It's a best of series from our presentations, and we are we are very proud of the, the good audio pieces that we're getting out now as well. Uh, you may certainly let us know that you are here. There is an attendance form just a little bit down. We, uh, we love getting a sense of our, our reach in that regard. And then at the bottom of the page uh, on our SiliconValleyRotary.com site, you'll find our forum, Discuss, D-I-S-Q-U-S, and you can leave a message you can reply to messages of others, messages about this program, about other elements of the meeting, and we would love to hear from you along those lines. So as we always like to do, we hand it back to our speaker for the final word. Camilla, what would you like uh, for people to have square, squarely in mind as they finish watching the video? Just, just take a minute of your day to learn something about Antarctica um, because it has the power to um, be humbling and inspire us all. So take take a minute just to learn something about Antarctica today. Wonderful. And everyone, we will see you next week. <laughs>